All right, I know we still got some people uh, coming back into the room, but uh, I do want to be cognizant of the time with the weather. We had a, a great discussion in the first panel, which went a little bit long. Uh, as I announced before, Nancy Ann DeParle is not going to be able to join us today, uh, but we are going to try to have a, a you know continue this uh, full and frank discussion uh, in our in our second panel. Um, so uh, uh, a lot more to cover in the next hour or so. And I want to reorient everyone who's here by just taking them again back to our overall agenda. Uh, we spent the past uh, hour plus focusing on some of the practical issues for accountable care from the standpoint of patients or consumers or, or persons uh, and engagement uh, on, on that side. And now we're going to turn more to the provider side. And this is where the significant payment changes are are occurring that are intended to drive this, uh, what people have called cultural change, which I think of as, as more uh, about uh, uh, really supporting changes in care delivery. And for all the criticism that the name Accountable Care has come in for uh, already today, uh, this is where the accountable in ACO comes from. Uh, the, the point is that these organizations for delivering care are on a track to become accountable, not just for the volume and intensity of uh, uh, services that they provide, but for improving quality of care and health while reducing costs for their patients and the overall health care system. At the core of this concept is not accountability for its own sake, but providing an effective means for supporting providers in their best efforts to improve quality of care and reduce costs. Uh, you can think of it as a reward. I think of it as, as uh, really support. As we heard about uh, earlier today, uh, a lot of steps around care coordination coordination, around getting it right for a particular patient, uh, around putting the person at the center of care. A lot of those steps just aren't reimbursed in traditional healthcare systems. And we've seen, especially with rising budget pressures, the difficulty of uh, making piecemeal changes in those systems to expand fee-for-service or something like that uh, don't seem to be getting us there. So all, accountable care takes another approach. And it starts with this concept of shared savings. Uh, because providers that, that are now tracking uh, the overall results for their patients get a share of the savings uh, when they reduce overall cost trends while improving quality that's what drives the additional support for these reforms in care delivery. And that notion of shared savings is what Don Berwick this morning called a core model for how CMS is thinking about and moving forward on implementing the ACO program. These steps are intended to make improvements in care more sustainable in a way that current reimbursement systems do not. Providers are, uh, have many ideas about how to improve care, uh, how to get uh, costs down, remove unnecessary costs, but often they're swimming against the financial tide and it's harder to make ends meet in their practice when they're taking this extra time or pay taking this effort to reform care delivery or make investments uh, uh, in changing their practice. And so that's what uh, the accountable care payment reform side is intended to address. The most basic version of this is the so-called one-sided shared savings model, which may operate within a fee-for-service environment, if that's sort of the baseline on which this uh, uh, new payment stream or new payment track is being added. It, doesn't, it means no new risk for, for losses if uh, spending continues to go up uh, without uh, improvements in trends. It's just an opportunity if reductions in spending trends occur, along with the kinds of measured improvements in care that we've already heard about today. Today, it's an opportunity for new resources. Now, many people view this as a relatively straightforward way of starting to implement ACOs. In fact, in some of our previous papers, we've just got described a stepwise approach to ACOs starting here, starting where many organizations that are trying to improve care and lower costs are likely to be in 2012, where they have limited uh, uh, availability of IT infrastructure and, and support for these kinds of care improvement efforts, and it can be a, a first step, an, an incremental way uh, of moving into a different way of being paid. You know, think of it as having two tracks for payment starting to operate at the same time. So we're still barreling down the traditional payment uh, track with fee-for-service payments or uh, whatever PPO arrangements are, are already in place. But in addition to that, there's a separate track set up where uh, providers are now starting to uh, be explicitly paid based on uh, tracking and improving 
overall results for patients, patient experience, and overall cost trends. And the shared savings approach just adds that on to the existing payment track. For these ACOs, many implementation issues uh, have already come up. Uh, even this kind of step is, is viewed by many, and understandably so, as a real change. Don Berwick outlined uh, a number of uh, these kinds of challenges for implementation. Things like how ACO incentives can be aligned with other reforms, things like medical homes, IT payments that are coming along now, movements towards episode payments, other steps that can help provide more of the upfront resources needed to support uh, these cultural and delivery changes. Uh, there are a range of other issues as well. How do you attribute beneficiaries to an ACO? Uh, what are the uh, uh, antitrust implications and do the antitrust authorities like DOJ and FTC need to provide more guidance going beyond what they already have produced on issues like uh, assessing the benefits of coordination uh, on the one hand and, and uh, 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 integration versus the risks of market power on the other. These are all very important issues and, and we've done a number of events and written a lot on them as well as uh, many others uh, recently. I want to highlight one further issue though that's at the top, was at the very top of Don's list and that was specifically the issue of including some element of downside risk. Um, that may be a technical term for uh, putting more of the payment weight for providers on decreasing costs, uh, trends, and improving quality uh, by placing them at some financial risk. I would think of it though as, as how much weight do you keep on that traditional payment track, the one that's based on fee for service or the way that reimbursement has traditionally gone uh, for the providers in an ACO versus moving to the second new track that's based on uh, as best we can measuring results, uh, measuring patient experience and measuring impacts on cost trends. So there are a couple of versions of this. One is a so-called two-sided or symmetric risk model in which payments are still predominantly going to be based on that traditional model, uh, but uh, they also include uh, the provider groups being at risk for losses if spending exceeds the projected benchmark. So that's a, a stronger incentive potentially for keeping costs down and maybe more support from the businesses or the, the other payers that are involved in these reforms for confidence that the provider group's really going to take steps uh, to improve care, to transform care. Um, this this was, uh, this is a still a relatively limited disruption from, or relatively limited discontinuity from traditional payment systems. Going further than that would be a partial capitation model where more of that weight in the traditional payment system is moved over to this second new track that's now running in parallel. So instead of having full fee-for-service payments or full PPO payments, uh, some portion of those funds uh, would go over to this new track that's based on uh, results of care and that gives uh, providers more flexibility in how they change the delivery of care to, and how they can provide financial support for that in the implementation of the ACO. So uh, this is, these are two different versions of so-called downside risk uh, with putting more weight on more flexibility in how providers can deliver care, but at the same time it means more of a movement away from traditional payment systems and traditional ways of delivering care. Uh, as uh, we and others have, have written about this in the past, one way to think about this movement might be tying, uh, moving more of the dollars over to greater flexibility for providers and uh, using it to reform care, to, to implement the kinds of steps that you've heard about uh, already today, uh, when they have a better capacity in place to demonstrate uh, that they're actually tracking patients uh, well and they're actually improving care, uh, particularly for vulnerable patients uh, and the like. So uh, these, these movements may occur in tandem, the financial reforms along with delivery system reforms and uh, supports for changes in the way uh, that care actually occurs, more extensive IT capabilities, more extensive coordination capabilities, demonstrated ability to help 
patients get to the best providers for uh, their own needs and so forth. So over time, as, as uh, care quality and technical support systems and IT systems get better, ACOs could implement payment models with increasingly more risk, giving them more resources to change the way that care is delivered, more financial support for those changes, and moving to payments that are increasingly based on uh, results, not just volume and intensity. Now, uh, as with many other complicated undertakings that involve both process changes, changes in the way that care is delivered, cultural changes, and financial changes, uh, this may be a gradual process. People may start with very relatively limited changes uh, and move forward uh, from there as capacities improve on both the care delivery side, the performance measurement side, uh, and uh, the financing to support it. But this raises some important questions. How quickly can it be done? How confident, uh, how can CMS and Medicare beneficiaries be confident that the risk, uh, these uh, risk-related reforms or these shifts of more of the weight of financing into uh, supporting uh, better uh, care directly are actually achieving the intended results and not just simply providing, as uh, was talked about earlier, uh, uh, a new label for uh, supporting organizations that have easier patient populations or would have had lower costs anyway. Uh, once again, with all of these issues, we're not starting from scratch in answering the questions. There are a number of efforts to implement ACO-related reforms uh, right now that are already moving down some of the, uh, some of the tracks that I was just describing in the last few minutes that are incorporating uh, some significant shifts away from traditional reimbursement models and towards uh, paying more for better care. Uh, under the uh, ACA, the Medicare Shared Savings Program also includes a potential opportunity to build in uh, this, this uh, more significant shift in payment models, and a number, as I said, of private plans are, are already taking steps in this direction. So uh, these are the some of the topics that we want to cover today. And in fact, a couple of the panelists on the stage with me uh, from Blue Shield of California and Atreus Health, as well as some of our own pilot sites in the Brookings Dartmouth ACO Collaborative, provide some perspectives on, these, on the experiences with implementing uh, these kinds of payment reforms in practice and what needs to go along with them to make them a success. How do you actually do changes in delivery, reforms, real reform in, in healthcare delivery, along with real reforms and payments uh, as effectively as possible? How do you set the spending benchmarks to determine expected costs? How do you address these, uh, uh, the, the, the risk issues that are beyond the control of providers, uh, those related to the underlying risks of the patient populations or just to, to bad luck uh, in uh, a particular year? Can risk corridors or risk adjustment systems uh, help with that and how can they best be designed? How can other steps be implemented for improving care at the same time uh, as ACOs are being implemented so that providers have confidence that these payment reforms and these delivery reforms really are going to be sufficient to, to move forward together. Now, questions like these are going to not going to be settled today. They're going to continue in the, most, in, in the months ahead. Uh, but it's important to take steps forward now. Private plans, states are doing this now. We heard about Medicaid in New Jersey uh, at length this morning. A number of uh, private plans around the country are doing this. Medicare has implemented some of these ideas in pilots, and, uh, and as we've already heard, they're, they're uh, required to do more in the coming years. And given the pressures of rising health care costs, the gaps in quality, the frustration among both providers and patients, uh, we really need to find ways forward uh, to help support their efforts to deliver greater value in health care. So with this tight timeline in mind, we're going to try to get practical in the next hour. What should be included in the CMS regulations for ACOs around these issues, particularly for organizations that really are ready, feel like they're ready to redirect resources in a more significant way, not just set up this, uh, uh, this second track focusing on results. Uh, what are some other related reforms that can help support the goals of ACOs? So this is, a, this is a tough journey, but it's one that we need to move forward on now. We need to do it, we need to do it right, moving from concepts to specific steps. So uh, that's what we're going to cover in the, uh, in the panel today, and um, you've heard uh, uh, you, we have a very distinguished set of panelists to help us uh, uh, get through these issues. Um, I'm going to start, um, you're going to hear next from John Burtko, who's a guest scholar here at the Engelberg Center for Healthcare Reform, and he's going to provide an overview uh, of uh, some of these more technical issues, and um, you know, John's uh, uh, really
really working hard to translate a lot of these actuarial uh, technical details into uh, the important practical implications for, for care delivery. After we hear from John, Ed Samaras, who is the chief actuary at Blue Shield of California, which is currently implementing an ACO-type uh, pilot in Sacramento, uh, will give us some perspectives from his experience. Um, John Goodman, uh, also uh, with us today, is the president and the CEO of the National Center for Policy Analysis, and he has written prolifically on a variety of ways in which healthcare providers are trying to change the way that care is being delivered and the kinds of pain payment changes that might feasibly support uh, uh, those reforms in delivery. Uh, so we're going to hear his perspective too. And Gene Lindsay, the President and CEO of Atrius Health, which is participating in the Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts Alternative Quality Contract, also has some direct experiences uh, on these issues. So uh, that's where we're going to go, same kind of format as last time. After we hear from those, these opening comments from, uh, from John, we're going to hear some perspectives from the other panelists, I have a little bit of a discussion, and then open it up uh, to all of you again. So with that, uh, thank you, and I'd like to turn this over to John Burko. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, as uh, Mark said, I'm an actuary, so I will try to keep you awake during this period, as opposed to the usual technique of most actuaries. Um, one thing is that uh, we get paid for measuring things, and that's uh, what I'll try to do and describe, uh, one, how we can be fair to both provider groups, doctors in particular on one side, and to CMS and the Medicare uh, Trust Fund on the other side. Um, and so I'm not going to talk so much about the budget setting mechanism today because there are several options for doing that, but think of the budget as being set generally on the basis of the history of claims that get associated with the people who would be in an HCO, but rather the more technical aspect of, well, what if the population changes? How do you measure how sick they are? And that is a term that's usually called risk adjustment. Um, and what I want to bring today is 20 years of experience working with this, including 10 while I was both at a private insurer uh, and then more recently working with Mark and Elliot here in terms of the way risk adjustment has evolved and developed over the last few years. Uh, a couple of things to note here. Among the populations that you can do risk adjustment with, seniors are the best, and that's because they're the sickest. They have lots of chronic conditions. Uh, I think Elliot's work and his, his crew have shown that uh, per, uh, seniors visit a, some provider uh, on the basis of about 93% of them every year. So there's lots of visits there to, talk, uh, to measure what's going on with them. Um, the next part is, as I uh, said, CMS has had a fair amount of experience with risk adjustment methodology. Uh, first started on a very primitive basis in 2000, but since 2004, we've had an encounter-based risk adjustment system. That also means, though, that Medicare Advantage plans and many, many providers have had the experience of collecting the diagnostic data and, more importantly, submitting that data stream in. And so this all depends on how good the data streams are and how well uh, claims and diagnostic information has been uh, organized and uh, collected. Um, you ask, uh, you could ask, is risk adjustment good enough? And I would say, yes, it works pretty well. It works really well for groups of people. And in the law is the minimum uh, 5,000 people to be in an accountable care organization for seniors. Um, I found that when I was in my practice and I did a lot of work with Medicare Advantage groups there, that was a very stable group of people. The predictive power of that is fairly high. It's up in the uh, 70 to 80 percent range for a group. On an individual basis, as you look to one person or another, it's much lower, but there have been improvements over the years. Most importantly, uh, prescription drug data is a very good add-on. The current uh, risk adjuster used by CMS doesn't use it, but the data is now out there for the last four years. So we could grab and uh, insert that data uh, with there. Um, one thing that Deborah alluded to that I'll say is you worry about, uh, does, it, does risk adjustment work well enough for the sickest people? And there's another technical term called the predictive ratio, which is how much does the risk adjustment mechanism pay for a given person that's pretty sick, say a senior with congestive heart failure. 
The good news is for most of those kinds of procedures, the predictive ratios are really close to 1.0, which means they pay very close to the amount that on average is needed for an individual. Now, I have probably have to give you one of my bad actuarial jokes. Uh, did you hear about the actuary who died, drowned, because when he walked across San Francisco Bay, uh, on average, the bay was only three feet deep. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so on average works pretty well for the whole group of people. And of course, it doesn't work perfectly for individuals. Um, one of the things that's very important, I think, that was alluded to uh, or mentioned by uh, Don Berwick and then alluded to by Deborah was uh, the way whether you do um, prospective or retrospective uh, attribution, and that's closely connected to the need for risk adjustment. On the retrospective side, that is, you look at what happened over the last year, you assign uh, providers or to patients based on the actual treatment patterns, and then you do the measurement. The physician group practice demo uses that kind of a measurement method to see how well things worked. Um, it uh, does a very good job of assigning people to the, the, the providers, the physicians in particular, that they actually saw, but it violates one of, uh, I think, what Deborah's principles were is notifying. Nobody knows, the doctors don't know who their patients are gonna be. They know who their panel is, of course, but they don't know whether a certain patient was part of the ACO measurement group or not. Um, second part of a way to do this is prospectively. And uh, I, I'm, I have to uh, say, I'm biased in favor of prospective methods in most cases. And so in this case, you would know who your patients are based on perhaps 12 or 24 months of claim history. Um, again, Elliot and his team's work have shown a high degree of loyalty of patients to the care systems. I think uh, Elliot was in here with 75% or so range. So people do stay in general with the care system systems they're in. So A, you can know who the people are. B, you can notify the physicians. C, you can uh, notify the patients you know, that they are in this uh, care system. It could be made uh, voluntary, if you like. And then I think most importantly, uh, in my consulting with uh, physicians and hospital systems, but physicians in particular, they're achievement oriented. And so you can tell them if your patients are like that, you can then monitor and manage what the actual to predicted experience should be. And things then get moved around. I think Jay's back in the room here and I hope you're gonna nod Jay when I say, you guys do budgets for your individual physician groups and pods and uh, measure them, and if something goes wrong or they're out of sight, uh, you nod, I hope, when they say they fix it along the way. <laughs> He's nodding. Um, so um, I think that's kind of an overview of all this. The tool is out there, um, and I think we are ready to use it. I would look to uh, Ed here if he wants to make some comments about how that's been used. In my experience, I worked for a very large private insurer, and we used versions of risk adjustment for capitated medical groups. The groups wanted to be paid an appropriate amount, and we needed to be fair to them because we didn't want them to run away and not be part of our system. They wanted to be pay fair so that they could uh, be paid the right amounts for the group of patients they were treating. Uh, okay, thank you. Uh, in California around, uh, around accountable care. Very good. Well, thanks for uh, inviting me. It's always good to get a taste of some different weather. You know, I live in San Francisco, and so we don't have that stuff falling from the sky too often. So, um, so I, I thought I'd start. Uh, California has uh, a long history of managed care, and uh, Don Berwick, you know, mentioned that you know, we, we can't have amnesia here. We have to learn from the, from the past, and Mark talked about you know, this um, accountability over time and starting, uh, having a starting point that's you know, grounded in, in where we're at. Uh, so the providers in California have been, been taking risk, uh, as I said, for a long time under both Medicare program and uh, commercial HMO. 
I think right now there's about 8 million uh, covered lives in commercial HMOs uh, that uh, on the physician side are fully at risk. They have full capitation, multi-specialty capitation. So the uh, physicians are, are fully at risk for the, uh, the care that they provide. There's, I think, probably order of magnitude a half a million members uh, in the MAPD program where they're uh, taking risk. Uh, so there's, you know, there's been quite a long uh, track record of, of that. And, and as a result, infrastructure you know, to effectively coordinate care, I think we've been talking about integrating care, you know, it's been developed over the years that uh, has, it's come from both medical groups and uh, the uh, independent practice associations that you know, are, are under these arrangements. Uh, however, there, there's also been some, some tough lessons along the, along the road, and I think in the late 90s, there were a whole rash of phys physician organization bankruptcies that highlighted the need for some oversight uh, you know, over these groups that, you know, in effect, were acting as many insurance companies. Uh, one of our current uh, congresswomen, uh, the second most famous one, uh, Jackie Speer, uh, sponsored legislation when she was in the California legislature <laughs> that uh, created a uh, financial solvency standards board, so this was back in, in year 2000, to advise the regulators about solvency for these risk-bearing organizations and, and how that should be managed. I was one of the original appointees. It was, I was actually appointed by Gray Davis, just to give you a time frame for uh, how long ago that was. Uh, and, and I think what we found in that process was that some basic steps for an organization that's taking on risk, uh, like having an audited financial statement uh, was important, that they have uh, IBNR calculations with, uh, you know, which took into account liabilities they have outstanding for care that was provided by maybe their uh, specialty network that they've referred to, uh, that they have to have positive surplus, you know, essentially be solvent, and, uh, and they have some reporting process going on regularly. And I think those steps have really helped uh, really lessen the number of uh, provider insolvencies that have uh, been experienced. And right now, that board, which I'm still a member of, is, is looking at what kind of rules California should have around solvency for ACO organizations. So this is a timely uh, topic on a lot of fronts. Um, <coughs> I thought I'd make another comment too. Uh, the results of capitation, you know, have been a little bit mixed on another front too. Uh, for for Blue Shield of California, you know, our business is uh, roughly 50% PPO, 50% HMO. You know, a little changes a little bit over over time. Uh, but when we compared on a risk-adjusted basis how the HMO delivery system was comparing to the PPO, you know, we found that. You know, roughly a third of the, the areas that we looked at, uh, there were clear cost advantages uh, through the HMO uh, delivery system. Another third, you know, it's kind of within the statistical variation and there you couldn't draw a, a firm conclusion. And then another third where the HMO uh, delivery system was actually uh, less cost effective than the PPO. And and also, those latter areas uh, were pretty typically in areas where the capitation rate had gone up pretty dramatically you know, over the, the recent years, uh, really through negotiating leverage uh, because of uh, you know, conditions in, in those areas. Uh, now, our most recent uh, pilot uh, that's going on currently is with our largest customer, CalPERS. And it's in conjunction with uh, the Hill Physician Group and the uh, Catholic Healthcare West Hospitals in the Sacramento area. So there's roughly 40,000 uh, CalPERS members that are part of that. It, it's sort of an attribution model within an HMO model, if, if uh, that works for people, because we really uh, have a broader uh, population there, you know, order of magnitude, um, 200,000 members uh, in Northern California. And the ones that are that are using these providers, you know, are part of this this model. Um, in conjunction with Calpers, we set a target of keeping healthcare costs flat year over year uh, from in 2010 compared to 2009. And uh, you know, all three organizations, uh, Blue Shield, Hill Physicians, NCHW, really stepped up to 
to uh, commit to that and uh, have taken on, all of us have taken on significant risk. I think order of magnitude on the hospital side, they signed up for uh, $10 million of risk, you know, to make sure that this happened and they could deliver these results. Uh, and uh, the, the way that, that these buckets of risk are apportioned, which is kind of the devil in the details, it's really around the areas that the different parties to this contract you know, have the most uh, impact on those, those cost areas. So there's a whole matrix of risk share by different uh, medical areas. And uh, it, has, it has really been uh, surprisingly successful. I think my team you know, is uh, overseeing the analytics of this. And in our last look, it, it really looks like they're going to hit their target, um, which compared to the rest of the uh, Northern California results uh, is the trend, the medical trend is uh, roughly 8% lower than, uh, which kind of in our business, we rarely get a, a good control group, but this is, this is as close to a, a good control group as we get. So their, their results have, they've gotten a little help from a mild flu season, but I think, um, you know, it, they've really uh, done a great job and, and the results have been there. Uh, so I look forward to maybe talking a little bit more about this as we get into some of the questions. Great. Thanks. Uh, Ed, uh, thanks for telling us about some of your experience. Um, John, maybe I could turn to, to you next. Um, you've written a lot about a range of things um, uh, going way outside the bounds of just uh, integrated and coordinated care that could lead to reduction, significant reductions in costs. You know, Ed talked about some big cost savings that they're saving from, saving from their approach. Significant reductions in costs, improvements in quality. I'd like you to kind of maybe talk to us a little bit about how you see uh, those payment reforms going forward and uh, how it uh, may or may not fit with some of these ACO reforms. Let me see it here, go up there. Um, whichever you'd rather. All right, let me just, okay. I can see the audience a little bit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Am I on here? Yeah. Yeah. I uh, put a post up on my blog uh, yesterday and I said I'm going into the lion's den at the Brookings Institution tomorrow. <laughs> And uh, I'm not going to be one of the lions. Um, a lot of people believe in evidence-based medicine. I believe in evidence-based public policy. And evidence-based public policy is the opposite of wishful thinking. And uh, with that in mind, let me confront you with four pieces of bad news uh, th this morning. And th then I'll give you some good news. Uh, the first piece of bad news is the latest issue of the Journal of Economic Literature surveys all the studies of hospital report cards and other quality reporting measures, and concludes that the evidence just isn't there, that the benefits exceed the cost. And they go out of their way to point out how hospital reporting and other kinds of reporting can actually cause quality to go down, uh, just as teachers will teach to the test if that's the way they're paid. Uh, doctors will practice medicine to the test if that's the way they're paid. And uh, if you're the patient, that may not be good for you. Uh, the latest comprehensive survey of all the studies of electronic medical records concludes they're just not delivering on, uh, on their promises. Uh, number three, the latest study on pay for performance medicine from Britain says it just isn't working in that country. And the fourth piece of bad news, maybe the most important of all that I want to bring to you, is that in some ways low-cost, high-quality health care is like pornography. And I didn't get that from a study. It comes from experience. Um, they're like in the sense that we think we know it when we see it, but we can't define it. And not only can we not define it, but we can't even list the characteristics that you would need to have in order to produce it. Now, there is a study done here at Brookings that looked at uh, high-performing hospital regions across the country, and they listed their characteristics. And uh, lo and behold, uh, I couldn't find, Mark, when I looked through your study, uh, any objective uh, characteristics that they had in common. There was some had electronic medical records, some didn't. Some had doctors on staff, some paid fee for service. So if I just ask the question, well, how can I be a high-quality, high-performing hospital region, uh, the answer is we, we don't know. So now let me quickly turn to the good news, uh, to balance off the bad. If we look at all the markets surrounding the third-party payer system, all the markets where predominantly we have patients paying with their own money, uh, things actually look pretty good. 
Uh, in the market for cosmetic and LASIK surgery, we have price competition, quality competition, transparency over the last decade, real costs going down, quality going up. Now I know in an audience like this, you all are too young and too well preserved to know much about these two markets, but they bear looking at uh, because they're working well. Same thing can be said for the market for medical tourism, both internationally and in the United States, and we do have a growing market for tourism in the United States, it's just that you all don't get to take advantage of it. The Canadians can come here and get package prices, we can't unless we're willing to, uh, willing to travel. The online market for drugs and medical tests, they so have price competition, transparency. At least in the drug area, the quality seems better. The, the error rate is lower than it is at the local pharmacies. The walk-in clinics, the telephone and email consultation services, and the New York Times tells us this morning the concierge doctors are all using electronic medical records. They prescribe electronically, not because they were required to do so or subsidized or nudged to do so. It's because these are essential parts of their uh, business plan. So what I'm describing to you right now are markets that work really pretty well. In fact, if the whole healthcare system worked as well as these markets, we wouldn't be here talking about the things that we're talking about today. Now within the third party system, uh, we have what I would describe as a sea of mediocrity, uh, punctuated by little islands of excellence scattered almost randomly. And Elliot and others here have, have studied these little islands of excellence and, and some of them look really, really good. Now all this is good news in the sense that from my perspective, th there's a lot of low hanging fruit here. <laughs> There's a lot of ways that Medicare can substantially reduce its costs simply by taking advantage of what's already out there, not by going and creating something new. For example, we could start tomorrow and pay the market price at all the minute clinics for every Medicare enrollee in the country. And since the studies show that these minute clinics have higher quality, they're more consistent in the service they provide, uh, they have lower, price, lower money prices, lower time prices, uh, than, uh, than the competitors. Um, we could not only start paying for all of that, but we could charge Medicare enrollees more if they went to the emergency room or to other more costly places for the same kinds of services. Now, if somebody said to me, well, you know, that'd be politically hard to do. Well, if you can't take the low-hanging fruit and pay more for what you like and less for what you don't like, if you can't do that, uh, then it's most improbable that you're going to be able to get to the top of the f tree and, and do the really hard things. Uh, same thing for the uh, telephone uh, consulting services. That would seem to be almost a no-brainer. Uh, no uh, the money price is lower, the time price is lower than the alternatives. Within the third-party payer system, if Geisinger uh, wants to offer a uh, warranty on his heart surgery so you don't pay again if you have a, a, a readmission, um, then we ought to pay Geisinger more for the initial surgery. That's a deal we really can't afford to turn down. If uh, Virginia Mason wants to offer us uh, a deal so that all the back pain patients go to the therapist first and then to the MRI machine, we ought to be able to pay more for that kind of therapy because that would appear to, uh, to save us money. And here again, if we're going to pay more for what we like, we can afford at the same time to pay less uh, for what we don't like. Uh, if the pharmacists want to do what the pharmacists have done in Asheville, North Carolina and give uh, consultations to diabetic patients, uh, we ought to be able to, uh, to pay more for that kind of services or start paying for it, period. And uh, if that appears to work, again, we can pay less for the kinds of physician services that we think uh, do not work as well. So what I'm talking about here is going after the obvious ways in which, or obvious to me at least, where we can save money and uh, a lot of money, I would think. And in the process of doing so, we should send out a notice to every doctor, every hospital, every provider in the whole country and say, look, we're open for business. And the parameters are, you know, if you've got, you want to be paid a different way, you have to lower the cost to the taxpayer, you have to raise the quality for the patient, and you have to suggest a way that we would know a year out uh, or, or two years out how we're going to measure this if, or how we're going to make some determination that you're doing what you said you would do. And as long as we stay within those parameters, it seems to me that we ought to be open to business, we ought to uh, be open to uh, everything that the providers know. 
You know, it's, it's all, I've always believed that no one in Washington knows how to lower costs and raise quality in Tyler, Texas. But lots of people in Tyler know a lot of things about Tyler, and they probably have all kinds of ideas about how to lower costs and raise quality. So instead of us telling them what to do, let's let them tell us what they're prepared to do, and if it saves us money and raises the quality of care to the patient, then we're all better off, even if they're the only place in the country that's doing what they do. Those are my quick thoughts, Mike. Great, John, thank you very much, thanks. Um, and, uh, uh, Gene, I'd like to turn to you next. Um, you all have some uh, direct experience recently with trying to reform the way that care is delivered with an emphasis on some of the things, at least, that John uh, emphasized, uh, telephone consults, emails, more uh, concierge-type uh, uh, physician availability through your practice, and it's supported by some of the payment reforms in the uh, Blue Cross of Massachusetts alternative quality contracts. So I think your perspectives on uh, uh, all of these issues we've been talking about today, how do we get to uh, what I think everybody on this panel has emphasized, which is, look, there, there are a lot of ways out there uh, that, that clearly can lead to better results for patients, better patient experience and save money at the same time. We just don't seem to be doing it as much as we like. How do we get from here to there and, and your perspective on, on that experience? Thank you. Um, I'd like to begin, I guess, as positioning myself sort of as a foot soldier reporting from the fronts of battle in Massachusetts, um, where in fact we have challenged ourselves to be a pilot, literally, for the rest of the country. Uh, in terms of uh, discovering that there is an outer limit to what we can afford to pay for health care. And I think really underlining the absolute genius and importance of the triple aim, and Don can change the name of it if he wants to, uh, but um, I should tell you a little bit about our organization because the um, HUC was a trip home for us, not a new adventure. Uh, we are the uh, legacy practice of the old Harvey Community Health Plan. And when Dr. Ebert started um, the Harvey Community Health Plan in 1969, while he was dean of the Harvard Medical School, uh, he uh, made a speech where he made a statement, something to the effect that um, we couldn't solve the health care dilemmas, and he was talking about those of 1969, by spending more money, hiring more people, building more resources, that we literally had to come up with a better operating system, a better approach uh, to healthcare. And we spent the last 40 years proving that he was right. Uh, and you know, sort of like Churchill said, you can count on Americans to do the right thing after they've tried all the wrong things. And so we're back to trying what Dr. Ebert tried to introduce to us uh, more than 40 years ago. Uh, we, I think, have had some significant success, but we shouldn't be too proud of ourselves. We're, we're somewhat like um, Kaiser Light. I mean, we, we've had an automated medical record since 1969, uh, always at the upper limit of what the technology could offer. And so we have had, for many years, patients on uh, electronic patient portals through our EPIC system. But... Um, what we have learned over um, the last 40 years, I think, would totally underline what the first panel focused on, which is that if you're going to successfully manage care and if you're going to um, make any difference at all in terms of achieving the triple aim, that your fo first focus has to be on the therapeutic relationship with the people who come to you for service. Uh, and we are reiterating the importance of that to ourselves through the AQC, uh, the Alternative Quality Contract, which has many domains in it that measure things from the, the effectiveness that we manage patients with diabetes and hypertension, but also focus very specifically on the experience of care as well. And sort of facetiously, I've gotten to the place where uh, the only thing that's important to me about attribution is the data. I really, really don't believe that it's important for the patient to have contractual chains that keep us to the practice. If we can't win their allegiance by the quality of the service that we offer them, then I don't think we have any success in, in assuming risk. By having a tight relationship with our patients, in the last two years, we've been able to do some remarkable things have we, as we've seek, been seeking to be successful within the AQ. So we, we've, mu we've moved huge amounts of clinical activity from one large teaching institution to another, 
uh, where we felt that the care was better integrated. Uh, that required a relationship with our patients that couldn't have been achieved by just them being assigned to us. They had to have a relationship with us to be able to trust their doctor in, in moving from one facility to another. And in fact, um, we've transferred lots of care from tertiary hospitals to community hospitals, uh, again, recognizing that what the patients want is a relationship with their physician that actually is meaningful, um, uh, and actually that they want care that's convenient, closer to home. Uh, and if they feel that their um, quality is high and our scores in uh, Massachusetts in terms of quality and commercial contracts is the highest there is, uh, then in fact uh, they're willing to do uh, what we need them to do to be able to accept risk. I will also say that unless the physicians in the institutions understand that there is a downside to a lack of performance, I think it's highly unlikely that there will ever be any change in performance. And, and I say that from, I think, a pretty significant wellspring of experience. I've calculated up that I think I've had more than 150,000 patient encounters, either in hospital or office. So I, I know of what I speak in terms of how you interact with people to lead them uh, to a position of it being easier for them to have health care, which in essence is what we're trying to accomplish. So I, I think the HUC, to get back to your initial question, has been very helpful for us because, in fact, we have, since, night, <laughs> since Helen Hunt put a, a dagger in the heart of managed care, uh, back in that movie, As Good As It Gets, uh, you know, we've sort of been aliens in the land of fee-for-service. Uh, in fact, we used to call it free-for-service because we were so bad at it, because the only thing that we knew was managed care, uh, that we literally had to go the reverse trip. Instead of learning how to accept risk, we had to learn how to build budgets based on encounters and revenue. So, the sad thing is that we're now in a position where we have a whole new generation of physicians who never have had to manage in, in a managed care environment or having to relearn it from the gray heads uh, in the organization who remember the mid-70s, the mid-80s, and the late-80s, and, uh, and have the, the deep reflection from the mistakes of the early 90s. Um, so as we've approached the AQC, we've really discovered the joy of uh, trying to re-establish a meaningful relationship with our practice, focusing on achievable things um, in terms of the domains of quality that have been established for us, and recognizing that if we don't do it, there is a financial downside. Uh, and I think that that, more than anything, uh, enables us to um, uh, engage in the real work that's necessary to move from, it's an easy thing to say, volume to value. Trust me, having gone into uh, fee-for-service for the last 15 years in a very significant way, uh, it's almost like substance abuse. You literally have to reprogram your mind to begin to think about delivering care to populations within a budget. I mean, you build your budgets on encounters and on the number of clicks from your rad oc and things of that sort, rather than actually approaching the budget from the point of view of what do these people need and how can we deploy ourselves in, in a fashion that's efficient and will achieve what they want, which is a personalized health care uh, that's of the highest quality. So the AQC has given us the structure to think about that. And um, our desire, hopefully, is to, in a very short order, return to what the image of the Payment Reform Commission in Massachusetts was, which is 100% global payment delivered through nothing but ACOs. So that's, that's our goal, and, and I hope within my lifetime it will be achievable. Uh, we have about 800 physicians, 1,250 other healthcare professionals delivering care to about 700,000 people in eastern Massachusetts within this paradigm that I've just described, hopefully later this year. Um, our affiliation will extend all the way out through central Massachusetts and we'll have about a million patients uh, getting care that's organized around the, um, the, the thought process that, that I've just been describing. I will say that the technical attributes that we have, including data warehouses, the automated medical records, and managers that understand or, or can dimly remember how we once did it are, are important assets that we're trying to share with our community. Um, 
everyone's re referenced to Atul Gawande's um, article. I, I, I have to put in this plug. Um, Don spent the first 12 years of his career in our organization. <coughs> Glenn Steele spent an equal amount of time with us at about the same time. And our most recent famous graduate is Atul, who practiced ambulatory uh, endocrine and general surgery uh, in, a, in our facility before he <coughs> moved his activities completely into the external world. Uh, but nevertheless, his article last week pointed to Verisk uh, as a tool. So, so we've invested also in this software that will, I think, complementary in a complementary fashion will help us get even closer to those hot spots within our practice. You know, you might remember from the story the woman with $50,000 worth of migraine headaches, which wasn't because she was an abuser of the system, it was because she was getting fragmented care. And we know that even at this moment, there are cases like that within our practice that we have to find and change if we're going to eventually deliver, uh, I think, on the prospects of, of uh, what the AQC has to offer. So I'll leave off there. Great. Thanks, thanks for those comments. And maybe uh, Jean and Ed, I could stick with you all for a minute. I don't want to do a follow-up with uh, the, the Johns here. Um, you all uh, talked at uh, some length about um, uh, both the, the payment reforms you've implemented and the, the, the care delivery changes that have taken place. John um, earlier went through a, a pretty compelling litany of lack of evidence in, in general of efforts to try to improve quality, whether it's by supporting EHRs across the board or, or, or just reporting on quality. Um, why has your experience been different? Why are you confident that you're actually achieving uh, uh, significant improvements in quality of care and reductions in costs. You both mentioned um, uh, the downside risk as being an important element of this, but it sounds like there were some other key elements too. So it's what, what's been most important in that? Uh, I think the uh, most recent understanding that we've had is that it's not just technical change we're talking about, but adaptive change, uh, and that we actually have to have real conversations with our physicians about uh, what's expected of them, uh, why were we doing this? Um, you know, th there's been help in the lay press in Massachusetts when you realize that the last billion dollars of money given to higher to uh, public education in Massachusetts ended up paying for health care premiums rather than for teachers. Uh, you begin to recognize that we've really hit the upper limit of what we can spend on health care in our community and expect to have a community that we're proud to live in. Uh, and I think that getting our physicians to understand that this is a professional, a civic responsibility, and the public really isn't interested in how bad their lives are, how threatened they feel by economic change. But in fact, it's the other way around, that it's the community that's threatened by us, unless we can change, um, I think is a first step. But that's a, that, that is a very difficult position for physicians to come face to face with. And, and um, but there's a tipping point, you know, in, in um, these sorts of conversations where people begin to get it and then get excited about resolving the problem. Uh, and I think we've gotten there. We focused on the positive deviance in our practice, those folks who just sort of innately knew how to do it, and we've gone and asked them what they were doing and then tried to transfer what we've learned from them to other people. We've been using tools like lean process management and things of that sort also to help us um, reawaken the creativity that's associated with the practice of medicine uh, for a lot of our clinicians and staff. Those have all been, you know, things that have helped. Okay. So we, uh, I think that what has really helped drive the success that we've had is uh, maybe a more simple uh, explanation. It's, it started really with transparency. And uh, because this was a, an arrangement that uh, involved our uh, biggest customer, CalPERS, we have a very transparent relationship with CalPERS and that we basically opened up those same books to the uh, provider partner. So there, we, we quickly got over the concern that the providers were gonna do all this work and it was just gonna enrich the bottom line of the you know, evil insurance company. Uh, and it was a really uh, you know, open book. And, and then for the, uh, the hospital and the physician group, uh, you know, in conjunction with, with our organization to be able to look at the total results of the population that was now under this arrangement uh, and, and to see what was happening uh, and have the complete picture and be able to collaboratively uh, work around uh, making changes, uh, you know, that, that really is what drove the results. And I think 
you know, this whole idea of lock-in or not lock-in. I think, uh, you know, if, if you live in California and you're part of an HMO, I, I've been for, you know, at least 20 years, probably longer than that, you don't necessarily feel locked in because, you know, every year you get to change and, you know, there's probably a, a bunch of other ways you can, you can move. So the other part of this was to make sure that, um, you know, Kaiser is an, another alternative in that, in that area and they've, they do a great job and they're, they're a tough competition that keeps people uh, motivated and they had to be able to, you know, have a, a, you know, an arrangement, a coordination of the care that people found attractive that would, they would, you know, join, uh, join that arrangement and word of mouth would spread and, and, you know, make it more popular. So I think it's been a combination of some, you know, some uh, indicators uh, that have, have really been very positive, you know, shorter lengths of stay, a lot lower readmissions to hospitals, uh, more people joining through word of mouth that it's, you know, it seems to be working that have, uh, have really helped make it successful. Okay, thanks. And I want to go back to um, some, I think, some basic points that I think both uh, John's uh, uh, alluded to about if, we, if we're talking about what the real goal is here, which is getting, or a real goal, is getting providers to come forward more with where they've got ideas on how to improve quality and lower costs and, and recognize that those aren't just going to be um, lost because of regulations, third-party payments, other um, barriers to actually implementing real reforms in care. And throughout the morning, everybody's emphasized that you know, if the overall goal is improve quality and lower costs, a lot of those ideas, if not most uh, of those ideas, are going to come from providers out in the community changing, you know, in the trenches, changing the way they deliver care. But then the second component of, of this that, that John uh, uh, emphasized, and that's really behind a lot of the, uh, the, the ACO focus that we've been discussing today, is having a way to measure that. So providers coming forward with a way to measure that, uh, presumably having some agreement between the providers and the payers. So as you said, there's transparency. Um, as Ed said, that there's transparency, and all these things can happen at once. Um, like some, some, maybe some final or some further reflections from both of you about how, you know, what's it going to take to really make that happen based on the experiences that we've seen around the country. Sure. So let me start with uh, TACO, the Tucson ECO that is uh, still a prototype. Um, but I, I think part of it went live on January 1st. And the docs there uh, working with Tucson Medical Center. So in many ways, it's different from Kaiser, different from your legacy system there because it's developed with community providers and under the umbrella organization of the sponsoring hospital. Um, the docs say, we know how to save money. We know how to keep people out of, out of the emergency rooms. In particular, we know how to reduce the readmissions. And um, I have to tell you that sitting in the room, the senior hospital people are all highly in favor of this. And the uh, hospital CFL kind of gulps and says, yes, I know hospital revenue is going to go down. But because it's a nonprofit with a strong community mission, uh, he, uh, he's been convinced. And I think their process of going forward on that basis to do the right things, as in reducing cost with probably what I think Gene would say very simple things for getting the first low-hanging fruit is on its way to being successful. And uh, there well, they did come, John, with these changes in payment. Yes. And you know, while the, the, the simple things you know, may seem simple from the provider standpoint, it's often not so simple to get the reimbursement to keep up with that, to, to have confidence that these steps are really going to, uh, gonna con enough confidence that the actuaries and the payers are really going to put their money where the mouth is, their mouth is behind not just saying they want to back these changes from uh, individual providers, but they're really supporting them. Yes, yeah, this is absolutely the case. We are cooperating with one of the biggest payers in time, United Healthcare in this case, who has gone forward and saying, yes, we're willing to do gain sharing. I think probably much the same way that Ed and Blue Shield are cooperating on uh, in the Sacramento area with CalPERS. So it's very important to have a cooperative payer. I don't think we would have made the progress we've made without the cooperation of the payers in our market. And you know, the HUC is the um, uh, from Blue Cross is the one that's gotten the most press. But we've had um, other uh, significant um, positive relationships with the, with payers, the other payers in the market. I think they're, they're each approaching um, the concern slightly differently, but with the same fundamental principles. And we're, we're, we're all, I think, learning that, in fact, if we ask our physicians and patients what it is they need help doing, that, in fact, um, 
they're beginning to get the understanding that things have to change. And I think there's a moment of hope that's, that's beginning to sort of well up from uh, all of the cacophony, you know, uh, about this and that. Uh, I mean, it's really pretty simple in the end. It's, um, you know, don't do the things that don't work, do the things that do work. And if you don't know which it is, try to understand. And, and uh, to treat everyone, uh, you know, with the sort of dignity and respect um, that you would treat a family member. I mean, it, it can be reduced to some pretty simple sorts of approaches. And John, I take your point about these um, parts of the healthcare system where there is no third party payment, but where you need this, uh, as others have talked about, this alignment between what the payers are willing to pay for and what the, the providers really think matters for, for changing care. Any further thoughts on how to, how to make that happen? Yeah, I, I think there are two things that are really, really hard for most people to understand. And one of them is if, if we can spot things that we think are really good, like the Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic or Taco or whatever, and it looks great, and you just think, well, why can't we just copy that? Why can't we just do a cookie cutter of what we see and that we like? And the answer is because we don't know how to do that. And if, if it helps in thinking through that, remember, we've been trying to do this in education for 25 years. For 25 years, we've been trying to copy stuff that works, and we have not been able to do it. Uh, so, so that's point number one. Point number two is whatever works today is probably not what's going to work 10 years from now. And so if you lock people in, you give them a global budget, and you say you've got to practice medicine this way, then you have an organization that does not have the flexibility to change over time. And I think what's going to happen, I think we're going to, I haven't said this yet, but <laughs> one more aside. I think we're going to have a huge, huge rationing problem in four years. The demand for health care is just going to soar. We've done nothing on the supply side. Uh, people are going to not want to wait in line as long as they're going to be forced to wait. And I think we're going to see a huge exodus from the system. The Mayo Clinics are just going to leave it all together, and so are a lot of doctors. And outside the system, we're going to have a lot of stuff happening that you all will like. You'll have electronic medical records. You'll have all kinds of neat stuff, and it will change over time. And, and, and my prediction is that, that the most admirable things that happen over the next 10 years will probably happen outside the system, not within the system. Interesting. Um, I know we're close to the end of our time. I'd like to open this up for some comments and questions from, uh, from those of you here. So once again, we've got the, the microphones uh, present in the audience. Uh, anyone with a, a comment or question before we break? See so, uh, over here. Uh, hi, John Houghton from Covacent. Uh, the, the question or comment is about whether we know what to do is one piece of it. And then the second is, can the ACOs end up in a place where they really separate the gain sharing on the quality of care and the actuarial risk and the reserves that torqued a bunch of um, health plans along, I mean, uh, physician groups a long time ago and, and was alluded to in terms of the, the uh, fiscal diligence that needed to be, it was, is happening in California. Um, so in terms of the, the elements of knowing what to do, it seems like the, the articles like Kawamoto's and others said that really it's, you, there are about three things you do. You get, you know the population, you get lists of patients who are falling through the cracks and you get what's needed at the point of care for the communication. And that's, those details are now getting incented on the ox side. And so uh, will that make care end up working better? And then the second question is, can, do you guys think the, a, a single um, or a, a group of physicians without reserves, without uh, audited accounting, can end up playing in this game if, if there's a gain share versus holding the actuarial risk and having full capitation? I think maybe start with John for that, and if anyone else has comments too, and if you could you know, specifically talk about this issue of, I think, smaller groups and, and groups that don't have a lot of integration, and groups that, I think, to, to John's point, may have some better ideas about how to do things, but it may be hard for them to, to show it and, and, and to you know, sort of take on some of the accountability we just discussed. So I'm going to start by perhaps uh, recalling what Mark said, with three levels of risk here, bonus only or a symmetric upside downside. Who is the organization or the entity that holds that risk? Uh, for Medicare, it's still CMS. And so you don't have the fairly stringent uh, things that happen that Ed and I are familiar with from the 90s in California. But secondly, as part of uh, 
having an ACO, I've, and I think Mark and Elliot have all been proponents of having that infrastructure that's ne needed to record what's going on, both in the electronic medical records for clinical stuff, but also in collecting the data and budgets and where they are, actual to budget is what actuaries call it, and being able to monitor that as we go along. So uh, there are organizations there, that article on advocates that was in the most recent health affairs is a good example of it, but there are a number of other organizations, many of them capitated today, that do that. But the infrastructure and the components are out there, they can be rented by ACOs uh, rather than having to develop them from scratch. The, the power of the pen is to make that change in care coordination, but a lot of those smaller groups or IPAs just simply don't have capital structures that allow them to take risk. And are we in a place where now you can separate those? So CMS can say, we'll take the actuarial risk and we'll gain share with you, maybe even symmetrically up and down, but you're not risking the overall uh, expense of the population. You're risking the delta that you're willing to take responsibility on. I'm very positive that you can, and I think we have several natural experiments occurring in our market uh, where this is the case. I don't think that every physician should be accepting full risk. I think there's, there's, I mean, we have assets that have been developed over years, and even in that context, feel you know always sort of marginally the breadth of, of uh, the possibility of financial failure on our on our necks. You know, we have the reinsurance and all those other sorts of mechanisms, but. Uh, what's happening, part of the interest that we have in uh, uh, affiliating with, with like-minded folks in central Massachusetts is that they have been reaching out to one and twosies uh, in that rural, more rural environment and extending to them without bringing them into their organization access to their automated medical record. Uh, and uh, we've actually created a coalition of folks that meet in central Massachusetts that uh, bring smaller groups in from, from all the way out to the uh, New York border, uh, where we are beginning to have conversations, sort of self-help groups, uh, about, about the, the nuts and bolts of some of the technical change, and also sort of, uh, if any of you remember valent groups from, from the 60s, uh, maybe I'm dating myself, <laughs> where physicians got together to talk about the angst of practice, uh, that can actually happen at the group level. Uh, and uh, so sharing best practicing practices, transferring best practices, which is essentially what Atul's been doing in all of his articles. I mean, he's been just showing that somebody someplace can do it, and if they can do it in Camden, why can't you do it in Worcester, you know, type of, of, of conversations. I think are, are very, very important, and we shouldn't pull the rug out from under that by saying that this is hopeless and we can't do it, because I, I do believe there's a momentum that's developing. You can feel it beginning to happen in Massachusetts. Uh, Interesting thing happened the other night on, on WGBH. Uh, uh, Emily Rudy, the doctor of uh, the daughter of, of Art Rooney, has a, a television program, and so she brings on the president of the Mass Medical Society and a physician representing a group that um, does accept the AQC. And the idea is to create some conflict here, right? <coughs> By the end of the conversation, they were saying the same thing. Uh, and and they, they had come together and coalesced around the realities that they both understood about the practice and the issues that she had hoped, I guess, create some tension for an interesting audience experience actually resolved into sort of a love fest around the idea that we had to do this. Uh, so I think that, that when that sort of experience occurs, um, you know, it gives, it gives heart to people who actually are trying to deal with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis. Interesting. Um, time for one more quick question up here. Thank you. My name is Gordon Litwin from Meridian Health System. Uh, in the financial markets, everybody talks about the need for predictability and stability. Uh, in the healthcare, I haven't heard today any discussion of the long term resolution of these problems. We're talking about innovation. But for example, if you talk about the electronic health record and you talk about the subsidy program for the physician component of that, uh, right now, while we're writing the regulations for meaningful use, the money for the physician component is to some extent at risk uh, based on certain political uh, situations that have 
appear to be rearing uh, you know, that view coming forward. And then secondly, with gain sharing as a component of accountable care, uh, you find the medical community <coughs> concerned as they get into it and the low hanging fruit is uh, obtained, what happens in the long term? So what is the long term, how do you resolve the long term stability issues in dealing with the innovative uh, solutions that you're seeking? May I make a prediction? Please do. All right, here's my quick prediction. That, that most of the insurers in the exchanges and, and in the employer market are going to go to what's called reference pricing. And they're going to say, you go to our doctor and our hospital, and we'll pay for everything. You go anywhere else and you pay the marginal cost. Now, what's going to happen is everybody with money is going to go someplace else, and we're going to have a huge explosion of concierge doctors, concierge facilities, people essentially outside the insurance system, with insurance paying maybe the bulk of the, of the fee, but the market really responding to patients paying the marginal cost. So, yeah, other think, thoughts on this? Yeah, um, one thing that was, was very encouraging for me in, as a result of this pilot that we, we uh, undertook was the leadership of the CHW hospitals uh, really, it's almost like the light bulb went on and they said, you know, we are gonna have to find a way to live within what we get paid by Medicare for our Medicaid, Medicare patients. You know, this, the days of cost shifting will, you know, come to an end. And, uh, you know, I've heard people describe they've now started to really think differently about how they budget, how they go into their labor negotiations. And, you know, with a, with a, a real goal in the organization to, you know, lower the cost, their piece of the cost, you know, that, that goes into this, um, this whole equation. And I think, you know, that's got to happen across the board. Uh, and then I think what will be left is kind of the growth in, in chronic conditions that we're suffering from, from obesity and all the other conditions that, uh, you know, are, are going to have to be dealt with because uh, keep, that keeps pressure on the system, even if you are very efficient in the way you deliver care. Sicker people, you know, just increase the demand. I think um, this panel's done a terrific job of bringing out some of the core issues and challenges in healthcare reform, especially from the provider side, which was our focus. So on the one hand, we are facing these enormous cost pressures with a lot of evidence of inefficiency, lost opportunities to improve health, uh, and, uh, and, and deliver higher value care. On the other hand, uh, some real concerns, and this came up on the first panel too, uh, that being too aggressive or, or too uh, uh, ham-fisted or, or uh, too, uh, uh, taking too much of a sledgehammer approach to trying to reduce costs is going to lead to some real problems with uh, innovative quality care, which uh, if you look, if you talk to the American public, seems to be their, their biggest concern about, uh, uh, about them and their loved ones getting access to, to high quality innovative care. So there's some, some good discussions about the way forward to address these challenges, but by no means uh, are these resolved. Um, I do think, uh, though, that we've taken this uh, discussion towards another level of concreteness. Uh, these are problems that are not going away. Uh, the, the, the challenge of uh, innovative care on the one hand, the challenge of reducing costs at the same time, and there seem to be a, a lot of support behind finding better ways, to whether it's through ACOs or uh, other payment reforms or all of them, hopefully uh, in combination synergistically, uh, to help providers identify and get support for steps that they can take to really improve care uh, and lower costs and have that uh, accountability, the way, as John said, of measuring it uh, confidently uh, go along with it so that we can get the confidence of the public and we can spend the, uh, spend the money as effectively, spend our money as effectively as possible. So I want to thank all of you for an, an, an excellent discussion here. I'm going to invite Elliot back up to make just uh, uh, some brief concluding remor remarks before we break. Um, while he's coming up, I also want to thank um, uh, the whole Dartmouth team for co-hosting this event and uh, also the Engelberg Center staff that uh, really did uh, the, 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 as I talked about, real health care reform earlier. There's also real work uh, to make these kinds of events happen. Uh, Larry Cocott, Beth Rafferty, Cindy Chen, Todd Wintner, Aaron Wyreter, Tucker Page, uh, Josh Pfeffer, and uh, uh, Sean McBride, who was up late uh, emailing with me uh, last night. I want to thank all of them for making it possible, as well as all of our panelists and all of you for getting here to make this an, an excellent discussion. Thank you all very much. Thank you.